Hello and welcome everyone to one more lecture of nephrology and in this lecture what we are going to discuss is parenchymal kidney diseases. Um, <clears throat> it's not the only lecture which we, in which we will discuss all these conditions. It will seem like you will feel like, like you have covered everything but it will take like another two lectures or one lecture or it like maximum two lectures to cover these conditions. This is more like an introductory lecture to make your orientation towards these conditions. How are they? So parenchymal kidney diseases means uh, all the parenchyma uh, or the structure which are inside the kidney. For example, glomerulus is there, the tubules are there. The tubules and the glomerulus to get together, you know, and the collecting ducts together, they form nephrons. So, we will start our discussion with glomerular diseases. Now, these are all the terms and that's why I put all of them together. Um, <clears throat> you can see over here, terminology of glomerular changes. Now, uh, why I am telling you these uh, ter terminologies because if you will not uh, understand these terminologies, it will be hard for you to understand what are different conditions. So, this is the glomerulus, right? This is the afferent arteriole. This one is the efferent arteriole. Then uh, they cut it. They cut it over here just to show you what's inside. So, or just to give you a three-dimensional view of how, uh, what is the structure of the glomerulus. So, of course, the, the blood comes, enters from here and circulates here and leaves from here. And as you know, that the serum is filtered, okay. We, in the previous lecture, we already discussed like well, how much is the cardiac output, uh, how much blood is received by the kidney, how much is filtered and how much is reabsorbed back, right? So, you can see over here, this one is called as Bowman's capsule. These are the mesangial matrix cells. These are the capillary loops. These are the endothelial cells, just shown over here. These are the juxta glomerular cells. And they are showing the endothelium, the basement membrane, the smooth muscles around the afferent arteriole. Okay. And here they are showing you the cross, like the cut section of the distal convoluted tubules. If you will pay attention over here, what you will find again the same thing. See the basement membrane, okay, of the capillary. Okay, so this is the basement membrane of the capillary. And then what you will see is uh, fenestrations, podocytes. Okay, these are the podocytes. And this is the parietal epithelium. This is the basement membrane of the glomerulus or the Bowman's capsule. Okay, so this is the Bowman's capsule and this is the capillary, right? And the space between these two is called as Bowman space. So, of course, like whenever there is any damage to these structures, for example, if the protocytes are inflamed, what will happen? Like protein and blood are going to leak out from these spaces. Or what we will, it will present as, it will present as, when the blood will start leaking out, it will present as hematuria. When the proteins will start leaking out, it is called as what? Protein urea. So you can see over here a normal capillary in a glomerulus keeps red blood cells, white blood cells, and most proteins in the blood and only lets watery fluid into the urine, right? Whereas in this one, what you can see, you can see that the proteins as well as the red blood cells are leaking out. So, of course, like whenever there is any Damage to these structures, of course, the red blood cells and the proteins, they are going to leak out and they will start appearing, appearing in the urine, which is called as proteinuria or 
in much earlier. <coughs> okay. So now we are going to discuss few terms, okay? And I think like you will be having a better idea what 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 how they name different glomerular definitions. So you can read like this is now diffuse is a common word which we use a lot in medicine. So diffuse means what? When okay, they are showing one glomerulus right over here, but in reality, you know, uh, there is how many nephrons are there? Two to three millions in both of the kidneys, right? There is two kidneys, so. 1 million nephrons are there, right? So, of course, like there's a lot of nephrons. So, the nephrons, when more than 50% of the nephrons are affected, or more than 50% of the glomeruli are abnormal or affected, or any disease affected them, we call that thing as diffuse. But if some of the glomeruli are affected, we call it as what? we call it as focal okay because like this one just one or like few of the glomeruli are affected so diffuse glomerulonephritis means what majority or you can say more than 50 percent of the glomerulus are affected focal Glomeruli, glomerulonephritis means what? Like few of the glomerulus, they are the ones which are affected. <laughs> then there is a term called as global, when all the glomerulus is abnormal. And then there is segmental, means only part of the glomerulus is abnormal. For example, if this all glomerulus is abnormal, we call it as global. But if, for example, if there is a part, like this part is affected, or this part is affected we call it as focal okay we call it as focal and that's what what happened in fsgs what is fsgs focal segmental glomerulosiclerosis so what happens uh, there is focal like just a part segmental just few segments glomerulosclerosis is there in the glomerulus right so that is focal or segmental. So focal, segmental, like focal, some of the glomerulus are affected. Segmental, only out of those glomerulus, only some parts of the glomerulus are abnormal, right? Okay, so this is about uh, this thing. Now, uh, as the name shows, you know, I'm, I'm using the word glomerul glomerulonephritis. What this term means? It means like there is inflammation of the glomerulus. Okay, so inflammation of the glomerulus is called as what? Glomerulonephritis. Now, whenever there is glomerulonephritis, there are two types. Proliferative and the other type is non-proliferative. So what is proliferative? When there is increase in the number of cells in the glomerulus, we call it as what? Proliferative type. But when the number of the cells is not changed, we call, we, we call it as non-proliferative. Okay. So proliferative when the cells numbers are increasing and non-proliferative is when the cell numbers are not increasing. They remain the same. Right. Um, okay, so proliferation is what? Like simply pro proliferation is hyperplasia of one of the glomerular cell types. Like what is going on? Either these parietal cells or either this endothelial cells or these podocytes, you know, or these mesangial cells, they are increasing in number. We call it as what? What? Proliferation. Then there is membranous changes. What is that one? The capillary wall thickening due to immune deposits of 
or alterations in basement membrane. What happens? For example, if there is some immune mediated or immune complexes, if you know what is high type three hypersensitivity reactions, guys, that you know, in the body there is there are certain conditions in which the antigens are combined with antibodies and they started circulating in the blood. So anything which is circulating in the blood, of course, they, it will come here. When it will come here, of course, it is going to interact with this because this is capillaries. So what happened in this one that the basement membrane, okay, the basement membrane, which is like this one is going to get damaged by that immune complexes. So when this basement membrane can get damaged, we will call it as, there will there can be inflammation. So that is what we say membranous changes are there. Okay. So for example, membranous glomerulonephritis. So remember, in that one, there is capillary wall thickening due to immune deposits or alterations in basement membrane. Then there is something called as crescent formation. So what happened is like parietal epithelial cell proliferation and mononuclear cell infiltration form a crescent shape in Bowman capsule, Bowman space. What happened in this patients? There are immune complexes which will come here and which will start depositing all over here. Okay. So when this all things will are going to deposit over here, See, what is the concept guys? Whenever we want to see what's going on in the glomerulus or in the kidney, what we will do, we are going to take a biopsy. And they are going to take a piece of a kidney and they will see it under the microscope. They will see how the basement membrane looks like, they see how the visceral epithelial cells look like, they, they, they see how the parietal cells look like. So when, this, when they check, for example, in some of the conditions, uh, like there is something called as RPG and that is rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis. What happened in that? They found like there is too much depositions over here. So they look like crescent, crescent shape on um, Microscopy, we call it as crescent formation. Okay, so I hope like you understand what is diffuse. So these diffuse and focal they apply. These are the terms apply to the population of glomerulus of the kidney, right? So this thing, then global and segmental. These are the terms which are applying to an individual glomerulus, right? Then there, what is proliferation, what is membranous changes, what is crescent formation. So now the next thing, thing, how these conditions or what is the presentation of glomerular disease? Like whenever the glomerulus get damaged, of course, like we must see something clinically or on labs. We must see something, then we can say, okay, you know, like this is this thing is going on, or that thing is going on. So, glomerular diseases has diverse clinical presentation, which includes anything like I show you this photograph, right? See, normal, abnormal blood and proteins are leaking out. So, which can be anything from hematuria. In the previous lecture, I discussed hematuria in detail, what is true, what is pseudo, and how we proceed and what is the classification. It can lead to protein urea. Again, in the previous lecture, I have discussed all these things, right? What are the cause of protein urea? What is the range of the protein urea? What is the nephrotic range of the protein urea? What is, that? What is albumin urea? All those things. <coughs> hypertension when people then the patient they lose a lot of protein they can develop edema okay 
and when a lot of glomerulus are affected so there is less filtration or simply there will be decrease GFR okay so each glomerulopathy presents as one of the major glomerular syndrome C now whenever there is any glomerulopathy whenever there is any damage to the glomerulus it can present as four syndromes okay okay I would start from the down the first thing can be asymptomatic urinary abnormalities right for example someone's kidneys are damaged and he started having proteinuria or hematuria for example but there is no symptoms yet or the symptoms are not developed yet so we call it as what asymptomatic urinary abnormalities the second thing which can form which can be there is um, nephritic syndrome or nephritis okay nephritic syndrome or nephritis now um, basically I would like to, I, would, I would change this acute nephritis to um, nephritic syndrome nephritic syndrome so what is nephritic syndrome I will discuss soon with you like even like in, in this lecture right so I will discuss I, I will discuss like what is the difference between nephrotic and nephrotic syndrome right so uh, nephrotic syndrome can occur right or you can simply say uh, we can we can say we can move this thing from here uh, to basically here right like this right and we can change this one to um, nephritic syndrome of course we'll discuss this again, okay so nephritic syndrome they have a, a lot of what you can say names or conditions can be there like acute glomerulonephritis or rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis can all lead to nephritic syndrome one of the outcome of glomerulopathy can be nephrotic syndrome okay and one of the outcome can be end stage renal disease okay it is also written as ESRD so end stage renal disease or ESRD is basically what we call it as what is the end result of chronic renal failure or any renal failure when there is end stage renal disease is there of course we call it as ESRD okay each glomerulopathy can be caused by a primary disease or can occur secondary to systemic disease I don't think so you need any explanation for that okay when when the conditions they occur on themselves we call them as primary when they are secondary to something else some for example amyloidosis in which there is abnormal protein deposition in different parts of the body even in kidney it can cause kidney damage so it means like it is secondary to amyloidosis right and there are many other examples and some glomerulopathy can present as more than one syndrome at different times okay uh, I will explain you this thing now in a while so what are the things I have to explain to you one is nephrotic syndrome and the other is nephrotic syndrome okay guys so first of all to understand this thing we must know what is nephrotic and what is nephrotic syndrome right so see what it says it says the nephrotic nephrotic spectrum okay or you can say this is a better photograph for that okay uh, it is a nephritic nephrotic spectrum see on this side they are they have written what nephritic and on this side they are written what nephrotic so see what's going on in nephritic or nephrotic 
in nephrotic syndrome there is injury to the podocytes okay again i will go here podocytes okay where are the podocytes these are the podocytes right here so when there is injury to the podocytes okay when there is injury to the podocytes here so what will happen proteins will start leaking out okay when there is injury to the podocytes what will happen proteins are going to start leaking out so you can say one very important point to remember here is what protein urea is the hallmark of what nephrotic syndrome protein urea is the hallmark of what nephrotic syndrome whereas if you will talk about nephritic syndrome okay what's going on here inflammation so what inflammation is there what will happen the cells will swell up and blood will start coming out so hematuria will be there or you can say hematuria is the hallmark of nephritic syndrome okay so what it means like someone who have a purely nephrotic syndrome they will be having protein urea and someone who have a purely nephritic syndrome they will be having what hematuria but in reality this is not the way the things work why because of course when there is inflammation of the cells there will be hematuria but there will be protein urea as well and just few of the conditions are like this in which there is purely protein urea but many of the conditions they have both protein urea as well as hematuria okay this is called see the same thing protein urea and uh, hematuria right see in nephrotic syndrome there is injury to podocytes there is scarring there is deposition of matrix or other elements in nephrotic syndrome there is inflammation reactive cell proliferation breaks in uh, basement membrane okay so or glomerulus basement membrane and there can be crystal formation so there like the hematuria is the hallmark of nephrotic syndrome protein urea is the hallmark of what nephrotic syndrome right so uh, rest like we had discussed discussed hematuria we had discussed protein urea so of course like if you if you will listen to that lecture carefully you would understand why i teach you that thing before then this thing right so now for example uh, okay so what we will do by the way uh, we are going to discuss these four things okay this one this one this one and this one in detail right but of course like this one not in this lecture because end stage renal disease uh, we are going to discuss like as a different topic okay um, now let's go to nephrotic syndrome first what's going on in nephrotic syndrome guys there is podocytes damage okay and uh, when there is podocyte damage what happens like there is leakage of proteins right so they have heavy protein urea the proteins which are lost are basically more than 3.5 gram per liter okay and <laughs> when we will lose a lot of proteins what will happen the patients will go to hypoalbuminemia there will be less albumin albumin levels in the blood when there will be less proteins in the blood again guyton you know how edema is formed if you remember there is something called as on cortic pressure so basically the proteins they hold a lot of water so when there will be proteins lost so of course like there will be uh, like the fluid holding capacity of the intravascular space will be reduced and the fluid will start leaking in the spaces so the patients will develop with present with edema and a lot of proteins which we will lose 
are the one which are, are playing role with in lipids <laughs> metabolism so the patients will present with hyperlipidemia and lipids even they will are going to fast lose the fat cells in the urine there will be lipid urea okay what we will found the urine is f fatty cast cells and oval fat bodies and when we will lose a lot of proteins of course we will lose a lot of clotting factors as well but before losing clotting factors we lose protein c and s as the first thing or antithrombin 3 so due to that the patients can go into hypercoagulable state okay and one of the way you know uh, to ask clinically like just to check either the patient have any protein urea or not so we ask the patient when they urinate either they see any um, foam formation okay uh, in the toilets so if they see you know it means like the patient have protein urea right so as i told you how we would know what's going on going on inside the kidney is by taking a urinary or a, sorry a renal sample uh, you can see over representation of nephrotic syndrome it can be remembered by a mnemonic called as leap l e a p so lipid increased edema azotemia and proteinuria of course like proteins are lost in very high quantities so when we see the these things on renal biopsy um, basically these are the few of the names which basically cause nephrotic syndrome okay each can be idiopathic or secondary to a systemic disease or due to drug okay um, like this is the name of the drug there serolimus can cause proteinuria without obvious glomerular pathology like this is the name of the drug so in that one there there can be protein urea but there is no obvious glomerular pathology now again go back to our this one see all the names which are written over here you can read minimal change disease membranous glomerulopathy focal segmental glomerulosclerosis membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis and nodular glomerulosclerosis come back here see minimal change disease focal segmental glomerulosclerosis membranous nephropathy okay so these are all what nephrotic syndromes these are what nephrotic syndromes uh, we will study these things in detail but like minimal change disease for example is the uh, very common cause of uh, nephrotic syndrome in the children right and why it is called as minimal change disease because uh, when we don't have sophisticated microscopes we use you can say low magnifying or uh, power microscopes so when they found protein urea in the babies you know in the children what they found is they said okay we, we must do a biopsy and see what's going on and when they did biopsy and they try to see it as a microscope what they found is basically nothing the uh, the architecture or the structure of the glomerulus it looks like normal and when you know this electron microscope scopes are invented then they again look the glomerulus under the microscope and what they found that uh, like uh, uh, there is some problem with the podocytes you know with the interdigitates uh, tating with the podocytes so what they said okay they said like the change is so minimal that you know it is not obvious on the normal microscope but when we see from the electron microscope of course that the changes we can see so that's why they, they name it as minimal change disease like the, the changes are very 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 minimal okay so same thing focal segmental glomerulosclerosis uh, of course there is sclerosis and see focal just few of the places and segmental just some of the segments of the glomerulus I have sclerosis right so what is sclerosis guys uh, like uh, you know, sclerosis or fibrosis means scarring okay so they found the scar formation in this one so focal segmental glomerulosclerosis okay uh, of course like what causes this one we are going to discuss them in detail then see membranous nephropathy or glomerulonephritis is one of the cause so uh, now this membranous glomerulonephritis can cause 
both you can say nephrotic as well as nephrotic syndrome okay but most of the time they causes this one uh, so there are many others as well for this for example thin basement membrane disease but like very 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 rare i hope you understand guys and remember guys <laughs> most of the time all these things which causes nephrotic syndrome are basically non proliferative glomerulonephritis what i'm saying most of the time the, all the things all the all the changes which causes nephrotic syndrome are which type non proliferative the number of the cells are not changed so you can say nephrotic syndrome results from non proliferative glomerulonephritis okay now let's go to um wait this one sorry um this one these are the nephrotic syndromes uh, all the things which i name these are the secondary causes when they are secondary to some conditions these are the drugs which can cause this and these are these are the therapies for this thing of course like we are going to discuss them in detail right so um again the same thing see this these were these three which i gave the example they causes nephrotic syndrome these one always cause nephritic but these are intermediate or simply these are intermediate these are nephritic these is nephrotic second thing is what is nephritic syndrome right so when we talk about nephritic syndrome um, basically nephritic syndrome uh, like uh, it's a subset of nephritic syndrome in which the clinical course proceeds over days okay and what happens in these patients because okay most of the uh, time you know it is proliferative type or proliferative changes like the cells numbers are increased or changed hyperplasia is there or dysplasia is there okay so first of all there will be proteinuria but less than nephrotic range there is see hematuria which is the hallmark of nephrotic syndrome now these patients they have azotemia what happens the creatinine and urea level in the blood started increasing and what we can see in the urine is rbc cast or dysmorphic cells remember when rbc cast cells are present it means the problem is in the glomerulus right many of the patients they may have oliguria they cannot form urine at all they can result to into hypertension due to salt and water retention peripheral edema makes sense puffy eyes and smoky urine and now the etiology of nephritic syndrome can be divided into low or normal complements levels now guys like what is this one again you have to go and read what is the complement complement system you know there is c5a c5b c4 c3 c2 c1 there is msc like membrane attacking complex and all this stuff so so frequently immune mediated with ig and c3 deposit found in gbm okay so see uh, what are the examples of nephritic syndrome they are giving anti glomerular basement disease small vessel vasculitis post streptococcal glomerulonephritis guys we already covered this thing in pediatrics and i told you after rheumatic fever see their antigen antibody complexes can go and can start it damaging the kidney can result into post streptococcal glomerulonephritis okay so when we talk about this one we can see glomerular glomerulonephritis with nephritic features so uh, how we approach this nephritic syndromes is like basically uh, we check Uh, what is the thing which is causing that for example if we found anti gbm anti glomerular basement membrane uh, antibodies you know so we call it as um, rpg n type 1 or rapidly progressive glomerular nephritis type 1 so uh, this one you can see over here what they found on 
looking the kidney under the microscope, they found um, like linear pattern due to what IgGs and C3 deposition along the capillary loops. Okay, so when they when they when they see it under the microscope, they what they found is um, IgG and C3 they are deposited around the slopes, right? So this is the hallmark for RPG and type 1. Uh, then you can see that it can be immune complex mediated, which is called as type 2 as well. So what in this one, uh, we found granular pattern due to subendothelial or subepithelial deposits of IG, IgG and C3. Now, okay, if you will Google and take out the photographs of this thing, what you will found that, that C uh, in type 1 and type 2, what's, what they are founding is IgG and C3 deposits. But the only difference is the place, okay? In one, they are founding these deposits around the capillary loops, but in the second one, they are founding it, um, you can say, in the subendothelial or subepithelial deposits are seen, right? So this is the case. And uh, after that, there is type 3 or non-immune mediated, okay? In this one, when we see under the microscope, there is no immune staining. And then there is double antibody positive disease, which is RPG and type 4. So what is this one in which we see the features of type 1 as well as type 3? Okay, we call it as a rapidly progressive glomerular nephritis type 4. So see what, what happens like when we found anti glomerular basement membrane mediated, uh, what we do, uh, we check like either these antibodies are present or not. So when we found it is positive, if it is with lung hemorrhage, we call it as good pasture syndrome. So in good pasture syndrome, see, it makes sense. Kidneys are damaged, the patient present with hematuria. The lungs are damaged, they present with hemoptosis. When there is no lung hemorrhage, we call it as anti-GBM disease. Okay. I hope you understand this point. Uh, <laughs> in this one, we check the C3 level. If the C3 level is normal, we call it as Ig and nephropathy or it does other causes. Again, see guys, we covered this condition in Ox, Collie and Purpura. Okay. Uh, but when, whenever there is decrease C3, then these are the causes. Membrano proliferative glomerular nephritis. It could be due to systemic lupus erythematosus, infective endocarditis, post-infectious glomerular nephritis or cryoglobulinemia. Don't worry, we are going to discuss these things in a little more detail. And whenever it is type 3, when there we don't found any immune staining, we check anti-neutrophilic cytoplasmic antibodies. Uh, if they are positive, what type is positive? Either it's CNK or PNK. So when there is CNK, the condition is Wegener's granulomatosis. When it is PNK, it could be schwarz strauss syndrome or microscopic polyangitis. So uh, see this one. A very helpful diagram, guys. See, this is the, a normal kidney. And this is a kidney which have glomerular nephritis. So see, uh, rest of the kidney is fine. It is not global, you can say, but it is a part of the kidney which is affected. It is not a diffuse, rather it is a focal, okay? And as we cannot see the glow, what is the condition of the glomerular? So we cannot see either it's focal segmental or what type, right? So uh, easy concept, not so hard. Very easy concept. Uh, you must know, uh, here they have given the mnemonic to remember the features of nephrotic syndrome as well. So what you have to do, you have to remember the features of nephrotic syndrome, you have to remember the features of nephrotic syndrome, and you must understand what I am talking about the spectrum, okay? So very, very, very important. So whenever there is any glomerulonephritis, see what we see is either um, the patient uh, have... Uh, non-proliferative type or proliferative type, right? Uh, so uh, simply uh, when the patient have proliferative type, so what can be the causes and when the patient have non-proliferative type, what is the causes? So proliferative causes is like, as I show you, IG nephropathy, post or post-infectious glomerular nephritis can be there. Membrano proliferative can be there. Rapidly progressive glomerular nephritis can be there in which there is crescent formation. So see, Glomerular nephritis uh, could be due to, um, could be a non-proliferative type, could be a proliferative type. When it is a non-proliferative type, guys, remember three, name of three conditions, not hard to remember. MCD or minimal change disease, FSGS or focal segmental glomerulosclerosis and MGN, 
or membrane or glomerulonephritis. So see, in minimal change diseases, abnormal protocytes on electron microscope, we give them supportive treatment like prednisolone in focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. There is segments of glomeruli develop sclerosis, presents with nephrotic syndrome. Genetic causes identified, steroids often infective, 50% progress to renal failure. And the third one is membranous glomerulonephritis in which there is See, membranous, if you remember, again, I ask you to pay attention to the term, see, membranous, there is capillary wall thickening. So, what's written over here, see, in membranous, there is thickened glomerular basement membrane. Usually, idiopathic, one-third have chronic MGN, one-three going to remission, one-third will progress to renal failure. Uh, when you talk about, when we talk about the proliferative types, as I told you, proliferative uh, glomerular nephritis is characterized by an increased number of cells. In the glomerulus okay so they present with hematuria they present with uh, hypertension they present with edema they present with hema proteinuria as well and they can present with oliguria and all those things so these are the types ig and nephropathy most common type of glomerular nephritis in adults microscopic hematuria is there okay and it appears 24 to 48 hours post upper respiratory tract infection or GIT infection. And IgA deposits are seen in the matrix. The other one you can see is rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis. So whenever it is there, there is in, in which there is crescent direct formation, like there will be deposition of this thing here. And we can see the crescent formation under the microscope. So it could be vasculitic disorder like Wegener's granulomatosis or microscopic polyangitis, RPG and type 3, or it could be good pasture syndrome, okay, type 1. Then there is membrane proliferative in which there is primary immune-mediated response, okay, secondary to SLE or hepatitis, usually progress to end-stage renal disease. And there is post-infectious glomerular nephritis, which occurs weeks after upper respiratory tract infection in which like we need supportive treatment and resolves over 24 hours so i hope you understand this thing not so hard just a little concepts are needed and then like of course the, the condition is not hard to understand um, now guys um, one of the thing which we had to discuss is uh, after discussing this nephrotic as well as nephr nephritic syndrome is um, okay uh, okay, yes, before going on, like other types, like if you will see, uh, rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis, RPG, and it is also called as crescentic glomerulonephritis. What happens in this one? Uh, these are the nephritic syndrome which have a clinical course over weeks to months, and it's a clinical diagnosis, not histopathological. Any case of glomerulonephritis can present as RPG and except minimal change disease, okay? Additional etiology is seen only as RPG in a good pasture syndrome and Wegener's, okay, leave this thing. Clinical features as what there is fibrous crescenteric crescents typically present on renal histopathology. RPC cast will be present and we classify them according to immunofluorescence. What this thing is, I already explained you here, right? Okay. So nephritic we discuss, nephrotic we discuss. Then there is asymptomatic urinary abnormalities. Guys, see this one. What's going on is basically these are the people who have rapid decline in GFR. Uh, they may have anemia. Okay, or they may maybe volume overload. So these are the people, by the way, who have protein urea, but usually it's not in nephrotic range. Rather, it is less than two gram per day. And there can be microscopic or macroscopic hematuria, right? As you know that isolated proteinuria can be postural. When you stand for a long time, I already explained you this thing. Can be due to exercise, can be due to fever. Occasionally can signal beginning of more serious glomerular nephritis like this one. So whenever there is isolated proteinuria, there could be some possibilities like prolonged standing or maybe it's a start of a serious condition. So, the other thing is hematuria with or without proteinuria, okay? But of course, like asymptomatic, they remain asymptomatic. So, it could be due to IgA nephropathy, 
it is the most common type of primary glomerular disease worldwide and it usually presents after viral URT I already explained you this thing in this diagram IGNFRT most common type of glomerular nephritis in adults right so just saying uh, IG nephropathy is also called as Burgess disease and then there can be hereditary nephritis like Alport syndrome these are the people who are who have sensory neural hear hearing loss so deafness with renal failure think about Alport syndrome then I told you there are many others which are not so important like thin basement membrane disease again it's a genetic related condition and there is no proteinuria but there is hematuria only it's a benign condition or there can be benign recurrent hematuria. Many of the people after febrile illness or exercise or immunization, they may have some, what you can say, loss of blood. We call it as this thing, right? The last one is, of course, ESRD or end-stage renal disease. Of course, guys, that thing we will study when we will study chronic renal failure. Okay, now the blood workup is hard to understand maybe for you guys at this stage but it's not difficult whenever we are suspecting anyone with any glomerular disease we will go for the blood workup okay now we check all the kidney functions so we will check the electrolytes we will check the creatinine we will check the urea we will check the albumin levels we will check the fasting lipids levels so see nephrotic as well as nephritic syndrome to determine the etiology, now the etiology is so complex, you can say. See, because I am talking about all the investigation. See, Hodgkin lymphoma can cause, hepatitis B can cause, SLE can cause, tumors can cause, HIV, hepatitis B, obesity, malaria, lymphoma, SLE, diabetes, amyloidosis, drugs. Of course, you will ask on the history. Come here, you will find what? There could be IgG and C3 deposits. We can check ANCA. We can check complement levels. We can check anti-glomerular basement membrane protein uh, antibodies. So, see, there should be a lot, a lot, a lot investigations, right? So that's why I told you it's not hard, but of course, like it's too much. So see what they are doing it's from CBC, ESR. They are doing immunoelectrophoresis. They are checking anti-GBM membrane. They are checking C3 level, C4 level, ANA for SLE, PNK and CNK for vaginers or Schwarzschild or microscopic ang angitis, cryoglobulins, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, anti-streptolysin titers to rule out any post-infectious glomerular nephritis. Syphilis test, HIV test. We can send the patient urine for the lab to check for RBCs, WBCs, cast and protein. We can collect 24-hour urine and calculate the proteins as well as creatinine clearance. We can do radiology. We can do chest x-ray. Why chest x-ray now? See. Good pasture syndrome. Okay. Renal ultrasound. Renal biopsy, of course, it will tell us what kind of thing is there. We can do urine immunoelectrophoresis Benz Johns proteins guys think about multiple myeloma we had already discussed even this condition okay and that's why the patient they go into renal failure who have this condition so the last thing I want to I would like to discuss in this lecture is basically the secondary causes of glomerular disease now guys see Glomerular disease can, can be secondary to amyloidosis because there is deposition of amyloid in mesangium. Can be due to SLE because there is nephrotic syndrome with an active sediment. Can be Hinox coli and purpura. In that one we will see Ig and C3 deposition. Good pasture disease. Vaginal granulomatosis. Cryoglobulinemia. In this one we found IgM and IgGs. Shunt nephritis. HIV associated. HIV associated renal disease okay so why because there is direct nephrotoxic effect of HIV infection there can be HIV associated nephropathy or it could be the results of drugs which you are using 
can be due to, due to infective endocarditis, hepatitis B, C, syphilis, malaria, and many, many, many more. Okay, so like, of course, like these are the uh, secondary causes for uh, glomerular nephritis. So I hope you understand uh, the thing, okay, uh, what are glomerular syndromes, okay, and how we uh, understand them, how we classify them, right? So these are all the investigations which are needed. Okay, so see you in the next section. Thank you so much for listening.